on this Thursday night. As suddenly as it was on, the historic summit between the U.S. and North Korea is off for now. But why would Donald Trump pull the plug on a deal he seemed to want so badly? What does the rest of the world make of this latest twist? And why didn't North Korea respond with fire and fury? Also tonight, Me Too moves back into the spotlight. This time, accusers put Academy Award winner Morgan Freeman center stage. And Harvey Weinstein is reportedly going to turn himself into the NYPD. This is The National. The letter was strangely personal, at times even melancholy, and certainly not what we're used to hearing from Donald Trump at least not entirely. But how the U.S. president canceled face-to-face -face talks with North Korea's leader has captured the world's attention tonight. And as Paul Hunter explains, both leaders continue to send mixed messages about what they expect to happen next. It's as if Donald Trump himself feels let down by it all. I have decided to terminate the planned summit in Singapore on June 12th. Restrained at times seeming to flatter Kim Jong-un. Trump noted the wonderful dialogue that had been building between the two. But the president's Based bottom line, it's now inappropriate to move forward. I believe that this is a tremendous setback for North Korea and, indeed, a setback for the world. In a letter to Kim today, Trump cited tremendous anger and open hostility from that country lately. He wasn't specific, but a senior North Korean official this week called Mike Pence a political dummy, while, as well, hinting at a nuclear-to-nuclear -nuclear showdown. Warned Trump today, don't be reckless, North Korea. The U.S. has massive and powerful nuclear weaponry, which, in his words, he prays to God will never have to be used. But if pressed into using force... We are more ready than we have ever been before. So what happened between these two? After all, there had been weeks of positive signals from Kim agreeing to meet Trump for that summit in Singapore. Then came the release of those American hostages. And today, in a remarkable signal of apparent goodwill, North Korea claimed it had destroyed one of its nuclear facilities. And yet, lately, a souring. Kim's people are said to have suddenly disengaged with Americans planning the summit. And then came those renewed threats and insults and a perplexed White House turned skittish. The reignited rhetoric brings the question, are the two countries once set to make historic peace now at risk of war? Well, we'll see what happens. I hope uh, that we'll continue onward. We'll see. At the end of that letter Trump sent to Kim, he writes, if you change your mind, please do not hesitate to call me or write. Tonight, North Korea responded, it's ready to meet any time. Paul Hunter, CBC News, Washington. Now, Paul mentioned that apparent dismantling of a nuclear test site in North Korea today. And Kim Jong-un wanted to ensure cameras were rolling as it happened. About two dozen foreign journalists were handpicked to witness the carefully planned display. They watched the explosions of several tunnels from a distance, but... There are questions about whether the site was actually taken completely offline. No independent nuclear weapons inspectors were invited to verify the site's destruction. And it's also not clear if the explosions did enough damage to ensure it can't be brought back online. Now, talk about the shockwaves of today's development spreading. Trump's decision to cancel the summit was felt across the Korean peninsula and throughout the region. CBC News Asia correspondent Sasha Petrosik is in Seoul tonight. So, Sasha, let's start there. What's the reaction been in South Korea? Well, it seems pretty clear that the South Korean president, uh, Moon Jae-in, who uh, had met with Donald Trump just 24 hours before this bombshell, that he was pretty much blindsided by this decision. The Korean government did not seem to be expecting it or know what was going to come. In fact, the first statement indirectly that uh, the president here made was that he was perplexed that all of this was extremely regrettable. He also said that this is the time and the place to try to solve this and that all of this should not be put off. There was a lot of surprise on the streets of Seoul today, too. 
The news was filtering through Seoul as people headed to work. This man hadn't heard. It's cancelled? That's disappointing, he says. But I predict the summit will still be held and can be a foundation for world peace. The optimism that's been building in South Korea lingered with some. It's not like they said they don't want to do this, she says, so it can still go well. Others expected things to get more dangerous. Now that the talks broke down, North Korea will have to take action to bring America back to the table, like launching missiles, he says. The main role should be played by North and South Korea, he says. We shouldn't count on other countries to influence us or act for us, like the U.S. That was Sasha Petrosik reporting in Seoul. Here's a look at what else we're working on. Oscar winner Morgan Freeman is apologizing tonight after several women have reportedly stepped forward and accused him of sexual misconduct. And as the Ontario election gets closer and the race tightens, PC leader Doug Ford is being forced to explain what he was allegedly caught doing in a newly released audio recording. Good thing it's at issue night. <laughs> Indeed. First, though, to Manitoba, where evacuations continue tonight in the face of a raging forest fire. Hundreds more people were airlifted today from remote First Nations communities. But for those still waiting for rescue, it's been hard not to fear the worst. Well, they don't have no, uh, no idea of what the, the, how fast the fire is approaching. They know it's close. That menacing fire sprawls across 20,000 plus hectares, more than three times the size of Manhattan. It's already reached the First Nation of Little Grand Rapids, where homes have burned, sprinklers are protecting others. And the fires closed in on the Powangassi First Nations Reserve, too. Between those two communities, by early evening, 900 people had been airlifted out. By the end of day today, we expect uh, uh, almost all citizens of those two uh, First Nations communities will be evacuated. One lucky break, a change in wind direction. The heavy smoke from all that fire had kept planes from landing earlier this week. Now, last night, the CBC's Cameron McIntosh took off from Winnipeg on board one of the rescue aircraft, but it didn't fly to the fire zone. Instead, it took a detour right out of the province. Cameron tells us why. In northeastern Manitoba, thick gray smoke billows above a raging forest fire near Little Grand Rapids. For many, getting away from it took nothing less than a military effort. Part of an emergency airlift for James Eichen and his sister the only way out. I'm relieved, really relieved. I just went back to get my sister. Over the last 24 hours, the military has been helping with an airlift using this CC-130 Hercules aircraft. It can carry 88 people at a time. The problem is it's too big to land in the community. So they've been landing here, Red Lake, Ontario, 160 kilometers away. There's a runway big enough for the Herc to pick up evacuees buried through the thick smoke by that Chinook helicopter, 30 at a time. I'll be your loadmaster on board C-130 Hercules this morning. It's all very tense as 60 people are picked up at once. The Aishans were in this first group. 24 hours earlier, they had to turn back from the Little Grand Rapids airport. They sent us back down because uh, there was a fire right by the airport. The helicopter ride here solved that. Now it only takes minutes to get everyone loaded. Then in the air, a one-hour flight southwest away from the smoke to Winnipeg. All around, plenty of tired and worried faces. On the ground, there's relief to finally be out of harm's way. Uh, everything's good. Feel happy to be here. Now, in a Winnipeg hotel, the Aishans wonder what they'll go back to. We might not realize how devastating it is right now. They're just thankful to be away from the flames. I'm just happy to be here. I, I wouldn't want to do it again. While now, just about everyone is out, those flames are also not letting up. Cameron McIntosh, CBC News, Winnipeg. And okay, Rosie, there was a big news today about the man whose alleged conduct helped launch the Me Too campaign. There sure was. Disgraced former movie mogul Harvey Weinstein is expected to surrender to police in New York tomorrow. But for now, the NYPD isn't giving away much else. I'm not going to get into any details on the allegations beyond that there are several and the nature, the in-depth nature of the investigation. I'll stay away from at this point. 
For months, Weinstein has been investigated for sexual misconduct in New York, Los Angeles and London. News of tomorrow's expected surrender follows a report that federal prosecutors have officially launched a sex crimes investigation. At least 70 women, 7-0, accuse Weinstein of misconduct going back decades, ranging from sexual harassment to rape. I was raped. And now there's trouble for another big Hollywood name, Morgan Freeman. He's got a long history of playing the moral authority in blockbuster movies, but now, in the face of serious allegations, his own morals are being questioned. Our Tashana Reed explains. If you want to get to the title, maybe he's not the one to take you there. His voice is iconic. His performances are legendary. But now the 80-year-old actor is in a storm of controversy. In an exclusive CNN investigation, eight women accuse Morgan Freeman of harassing them, making inappropriate comments about their bodies or subjecting them to unwanted touching. Another source claims he witnessed Freeman massage the shoulder of a young intern who appeared visibly uncomfortable by the touching. Sixteen really people say they were victims or witnessed Freeman's Stop. behavior on movie sets or at his production company, Stop. Revelations Stop. Entertainment. A 20 year old production disease. assistant on the set of his film, Going in Style, says on one occasion two years ago, Freeman tried to lift her skirt, asking if she was wearing underwear. What's so alarming about what's, uh, what's been alleged in our report? Um, much of it was happening out in the open. He began Chloe Malas, co author of the investigation, had her own encounter with Freeman a year ago. It was unlike anything I truly have ever experienced. In this comment that's on tape, he says to me, boy, do I wish I was there, while looking me up and down. I was six months pregnant at the time. Freeman responded to the allegations in a statement, saying anyone who knows me or has worked with me knows I'm not someone who would intentionally offend or knowingly make anyone feel uneasy. I apologize to anyone who felt uncomfortable or disrespected. That was never my intent. But will saying sorry be enough? This Vancouver PR expert doesn't think so. Some of the comments that he's made uh, have been captured on, on tape. So he's going to be getting, I think, a lot of specific questions in the days to come. And he's going to have to have more specific answers. I don't think he can just shrug it off. Good news, Vancouver. In light of the allegations, Vancouver's transit system pressed pause on a campaign that features Freeman's voice. And his biggest client, Visa, has announced it will suspend all of its ads featuring the actor. Tashana Reed, CBC News, Toronto. And as more and more women continue to speak up about sexual misconduct, next week on The National, I speak with a driving force in that effort, Gloria Allred, the lawyer whose clients helped bring down Bill Cosby. Take a look. I'm attorney Gloria Allred. I represent 33 accusers of Bill Cosby. For decades, it seems attorney Gloria Allred could be found at the center of every big news celebrity case advocating for women. No surprise then, just moments after news of Bill Cosby's verdict, Allred declared victory. Women were finally believed. Bill Cosby, three words for you. Guilty, guilty, guilty! guilty. Thank you. How are you? Good. Very nice to meet nice you. Nice to meet you, Ms. Allred. Please. In the wake of that incredible news, we went to meet Gloria Allred in her Los Angeles office. There's lots of things that critics say about you. Self-promoter, grandstander, media manipulator, mm -hmm. a sensationalist. Do you understand why people try to label you that way? There are many people who would like women to be silenced, and they're very, very disturbed by the fact that I help individuals who are not celebrities, who allege that they have been victimized by celebrities, to be heard. Mm -hmm. And there are people who don't like that. But women's voices matter. That's next week on The National. Meanwhile, the U.S. president is looking into whether imported cars threaten national security. And that has some big implications, as you can imagine, for the Canadian auto industry. Donald Trump is threatening to enact a rarely used trade provision, which has never been applied to the auto industry before. And as Katie Simpson tells us, politicians on this side of the border are wondering if this is just actually a negotiating tactic or something more. 
The Foreign Affairs Minister emerged from a high-level meeting on Canada-U.S. relations to face questions about yet another sore spot with the Trump administration. The idea that those cars po could in any way pose a national security threat to the United States is frankly absurd. The president has ordered an investigation into whether the U.S. should impose a 25% tariff on all imported vehicles and auto parts. The American reasoning is that auto sector job losses have hurt the economy and in turn threatens U.S. national security. The prime minister isn't buying that logic. We know that this is very much uh, uh, linked to ongoing negotiations around moving forward on NAFTA. The U.S. may use the threat of auto tariffs to get what it wants at the NAFTA negotiating table. American officials are already trying the tactic by threatening to impose separate tariffs on steel and aluminum. Really his target with these is Europe. But this former U.S. diplomat thinks Trump's goal goes well beyond NAFTA talks. This is about the larger trade war that President Trump is waging against the rest of the world. Trump has lashed out at Germany and Europe at large over how difficult it is for American automakers to sell their products overseas. But if Canada or Mexico are included in any new auto tariffs, the consequences could be significant since the North American supply chain is deeply integrated. It'll have a huge negative impact on the United States as well. 65% of all uh, parts that go into Canadian-made cars come from the United States. The investigation into whether there should be new auto tariffs will take the U.S. months to complete, which means politicians here will have an opportunity to lobby for an exemption. Katie Simpson, CBC News, Ottawa. This national security provision, 232, was created back in 1962, and it has, in fact, been enacted several times before in the United States. In 1982, it was used to ban the import of crude oil from Libya. The Gaddafi regime was suspected by Washington of supporting terrorism. Oil imports from all nations came under scrutiny in 1989, 1994, and 1999. More recently, before this year, it was referenced in 2001 over the effects of iron ore and semi-finished steel imports. But investigators found there was insufficient national security risk in that case. We have a lot more ahead tonight on The National. Ireland could make history tomorrow in a referendum on abortion. We'll talk to expats who are making the trip home from Canada to cast their votes. First, though, the Kremlin may still deny it, but investigators say they have zero doubt. Malaysia Airlines Flight 17 was shot down by the Russian military. What this could mean for a criminal trial. And a new twist tonight in the Ontario election campaign as his lead in the polls narrows. An audio recording surfaces that has PC leader Doug Ford facing some tough questions. Doug, why did you tell people that they didn't have to pay for their memberships? Because that's you, it's, you're not supposed to give memberships for free. It's a um, tough time for everyone when you lose a family member, but it touches everybody particularly hard when it's a child. Tonight on The National, police investigating how a toddler in B.C. was able to wander away from her daycare yesterday. Just a month shy of her second birthday, she was found dead in a nearby pool. The daycare in Mission, about a two-hour drive from Vancouver, had its license suspended today. We're also learning more tonight about another tragic death. This one involves a three-year-old boy who was found yesterday in a parked vehicle in Burlington, Ontario. Police confirmed today that he died of heat exposure after being left there for too long. No word yet on criminal charges. And the troubling photo of a Canadian woman that sparked an investigation in Scotland. Deanne Fitzpatrick was working as a fisheries officer for the Scottish government back in 2010 when this photo was taken. She told the BBC she was bound and gagged by male co-workers after she spoke out about abuse in her office. The incident, she said, was part of a decade's worth of workplace harassment where her complaints were not taken seriously. Today, though, after the photo was made public, a promise of change from Scotland's First Minister. I am absolutely horrified at the photograph. Bullying, abuse, sexism, racism have no place in any workplace. And let me be very clear today, they will not be tolerated. 
Nicola Sturgeon went on to say she's ordered a full review of the case. Fitzpatrick's family, meanwhile, says she's hopeful that something will be done now that her story is public. Well, a big development today in the case of Malaysia Airlines Flight 17. That's the passenger plane shot out of the sky over Ukraine in 2014. Almost 300 people on board were killed. Russia has always denied involvement, but an international team of investigators now says it can prove otherwise. The CBC's Margaret Evans looks at their case. The fate of flight MH17 has cast a long shadow since it was shot down in the skies above eastern Ukraine nearly four years ago now, especially for the friends and family of the 298 people killed. But for the investigators, too, who struggled to piece together evidence given limited access to the pro-Russian rebel-held territory and ongoing conflict in the region. But today, Dutch-led investigators said they have hard evidence that the missile used to bring the plane down belonged to the Russian military, and they named the brigade. The Buk, the Buk missile system that downed flight MH17, he's saying, originated from the 53rd Anti-Aircraft Missile Brigade from Kursk in the Russian Federation. The joint investigation they used a graphic to show exactly where the brigade was located and said that a convoy of Russian armed forces vehicles had transported the missile system across the border and then back again after the plane had been shot down. The Kremlin has repeatedly denied involvement and did so again today, calling the allegations gratuitous. Online investigative journalist Elliot Higgins has written extensively about the alleged Russian involvement. He says Moscow will play hardball. They might intimidate witnesses, they might try and have evidence uh, taking out the um, prosecution. The Malaysian Airlines flight was en route from Amsterdam to Kuala Lumpur. The majority of the passengers were Dutch nationals. Dutch prosecutors say they will pursue a criminal case, that they're now looking for individuals in that Russian convoy and further up the ranks. One of the important questions is, of course, um, uh, how was the chain of command, at what level the decision has been made. That, of course, will be a much harder task. The Dutch Prime Minister, Mark Rutte, will return home from abroad early to attend a special cabinet meeting on the findings tomorrow. Margaret Evans, CBC News, London. Next on The National, there are just two weeks now until Ontario votes, and polls suggest the NDP seems to be closing in on the Tories. It's been far from a smooth campaign for all three parties, which is why we thought, hey, let's get these three together tonight. Andrew Chantel, who we love and adore, and then our own CBC poll tracker numbers guy, Eric Grenier. They're all here for At Issue after this break. Two weeks from today, Ontario votes. Today, another campaign bump in the road for progressive conservative leader and the perceived frontrunner, Doug Ford. Hannah Thibodeau explains why his rivals are now claiming Ford may have violated election rules. It's a bad time for a scandal. Doug Ford, the progressive conservative leader, was allegedly caught on audio tape selling fake memberships for his preferred candidate, Kinga Surma. You don't have to throw them. She'll put your name, number, and just sign it. Yeah. If you're interested, sir, we'll do it for you. On the tape, you hear Ford encouraging potential party members to leave forms incomplete and that the $10 registration fee would be paid for them. It doesn't cost anything. We're just signing people up today. That's it. The audio was released by the Ontario Liberals. It was recorded before Ford was party leader. The man who gave the Liberals the tape says... He wants to remain anonymous. These practices contradict the rules and regulations that Mr. Ford, as leader, has pledged to enforce. Ford didn't deny the authenticity of the tape, and he didn't deny that he helped Surma. Our family in Etobicoke Center, we've helped for the last 30 years candidates. Ford has been dogged by controversial candidates throughout the campaign. Last week, a candidate was forced to resign. He was allegedly tied to the theft of personal information of users of the 407 toll highway, which may have been used inappropriately by candidates in nomination races. 
The NDP has called on Elections Ontario to investigate 12 other campaigns. Ford has repeatedly shifted the blame on the former leader. And this goes back again, my friends, to, to Patrick Brown. This goes back to Patrick Brown. But this latest mess now implicates Ford. Whether you're the person that broke the rules to get your chosen candidate nominated, or whether you're the person that's using stolen information uh, to try to rig a nomination meeting, I mean, these things are all... I mean, it's a, it's, a, it's a stinking mess, to be honest with you. If there have been breaches of the, the rules, of the law, around nominations, then I think Mr. Ford has to answer for those. This is a crucial time for Ford and his team. When the election started, it looked like they would walk to a majority government. But with less than two weeks to go, polls show they're neck and neck with the NDP. Hannah Thibodeau, CBC News, Ottawa. Okay, so on the matter of polls, the CBC News poll tracker is measuring the trends as we inch closer to the June 7th election day. Right now, our models show that the PCs do hold the lead, with the NDP less than two points behind. The Liberals have dropped to new lows. That's where things stand right now, at the halfway mark of the campaign. Now, time for some analysis. Now it's at issue's turn to check in on the Ontario election. They've been dying to do it. We have the man behind CBC's poll tracker here to help us. Eric Grenier joins us for the first time from here in Ottawa. And, of course, Andrew Coyne is in Toronto and Chantal Hébert is in Montreal. OK, we're sort of about the halfway point in this election. Let, let's start with the, the party we were just hearing from there with, with Hannah, uh, and that's Doug Ford and the Progressive Conservatives. Andrew, let me start with you. Uh, it seemed like this was their election to lose at one point, and I'm not saying things have changed, that the winning is out of the realm of possibility here at all, but how would you say they have been doing so far as we hit this midway point? Uh, not well, and partly that's uh, a result of setting up those expectations. It isn't just that everybody expected them to be the runaway winners. You had Doug Ford at one point saying they were going to win the largest majority in the history of Ontario. Uh, so that's, you know, most people would say in politics, you want to under-promise and over-deliver. In the course of the campaign, he has been um, weak, I think, has looked uh, um, uncertain and unclear on issues. Uh, they've had this back and forth about whether they're going to release their platform or not. Mm -hmm, their numbers mm -hmm. don't appear to add up. They don't seem to care that much that they don't add up. So I think a mixture of overconfidence and the weakness of the performance of the leader um, uh, plus, you know, things from the Liberal war room that have thrown them off, uh, yeah. off stride. So, yeah, they've come down probably four or five points since the beginning of the campaign. I don't think you would say they, would, they, they were very happy. They shouldn't be very happy with the course of the campaign so far. And I, I wondered, Chantal, and this, this may be naive of me, but I wondered whether it was because Doug Ford isn't being really Doug Ford. And, and, and I guess there, there was an attempt to try and contain him to some extent, but it's almost like you can't even see him now. I'm not sure what Doug Ford being Doug Ford would be, and I'm guessing a lot of voters are feeling unease over that. Mm -hmm. The fact is that if you're going to go in the campaign as the front runner, it's a really tough spot to be in. And if you're also the new face, you should go in the campaign knowing that people will be kicking the tires on, on you, because mm -hmm. especially since you've advertised that you'll have the largest majority in Ontario history, so you're presumably the premier, the incoming premier. Sure. And I don't think that the game plan the, of the Conservatives to date lived up to that necessity. I, I, I'm not sure anyone really knows what the game plan is either uh, at this if stage. If there is one. Yeah. Um, Eric, give us your assessment of sort of where they started and, and where they are at now um, in, in terms of the polls and the, the analysis you've been doing. Well, they started out the campaign in a really strong position to win a majority government because, in part, the vote w of the Liberals and the NDP was more or less split between them. So the mm -hmm. Conservatives were in an even stronger position than they might have been otherwise. But uh, the challenge for the Conservatives in this campaign was just not to give voters a reason not to vote for the PCs. Uh, because of the desire for change that we've seen in polling as high as 83 percent in, this, right. uh, in, in the province, all Doug Ford needed to do was be a safe alternative, a safe conduit 
uh, for that change. But instead, what we've seen throughout this campaign, with the issues that have come up, with Doug Ford's own performance, uh, that he's given voters who maybe were looking for a reason not to vote for the PCs, he's provided yeah. those reasons as this campaign has gone on. So there's a couple things happening here, and, and you alluded to one of them, Eric, and that is this desire for change that <laughs> Kathleen Wynne is wearing after 15 years in, of uh, Liberal government in, in Ontario, more than 15 years. And she has removed herself from a lot of the, the campaign ads, but this week she put herself back in. And I think we have a little bit of one of the ads where she is now saying that she can do better. And I want your assessment uh, after this of, of why we think people dislike her or the party so much at this stage? Here's a little bit of that ad. I can do better. How can I make life better for you? That's what I think about when I get up to run at five in the morning. Government isn't about winning power. It's using the power you're given to help. What, what do you make of that, Andrew? The fact that she is now back in the ads, but saying that she is not, she, she admits that she could do a lot more. Well, it's clear that, that among the liabilities for the Liberals, and they have many, but one of them is the leader. Uh, I, people make a lot out of that. That's not necessarily that unusual. I think she's wearing some of the sins of the previous McGuinty government as well, yeah. but she came in as the person who was going to be the, you know, the change without changing parties. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a certain measure of disappointment with her in that regard, that some of it was sort of the same old, same old that we'd uh, learned to <laughs> endure under McGuinty. So I think it's partly that. Um, and, you know, you've been in power for 15 years, you've accumulated baggage in terms of broken promises, in terms of uh, expenditure scandals, you know, okay. there's a lot for this government to wear at this point. Chantal, what do you think it is about Kathleen Wynne? Uh, at this point that uh, she, but also her party, have lost their audience. Uh, I, I think it would take a lot more than I can do better to, to get that back. She is saying all kinds of things. The government as the incumbent government has had a lot of time to try to put things in the frame that would make the party look better. Uh, and people have turned it off the, the Liberals. It seems when you look at how the campaign has unfolded that the large majority of Ontarians started the campaign by saying my first uh, bottom line is I will not vote Liberal. Yeah. Mm. Uh, so, and and yeah. once that happens, Ask uh, the Conservatives and Kim Campbell what happens. So, so Eric, it, it, would it matter who the leader is? It, it, is it about Kathleen Wynne or is it about all these other things? Well, if, if it was someone else other than Kathleen Wynne, I think the Liberals would probably still be in the same position. Fifteen years is a very long time for any government to try yeah. to uh, secure re-election for a fifth time. Uh, Kathleen Wynne isn't much of a—she doesn't help her candidates, and we're hearing that throughout the campaign, that some candidates are saying, please don't come to the riding. And we've mm -hmm. seen a lot of candidates also emphasizing uh, the re-election of a good MPP rather than a good government. But there's actually some shades of the last time that the Liberals were defeated in an election in 1990. It was suggested to David Peterson that he come out with an ad saying, I can do better. Uh, he didn't want to do that. And in the end, the Liberals lost that election. Okay, so well, that leads us to what was long the third party, uh, but certainly one of the most experienced leaders, uh, and that's Andrea Horvath. This week she had to explain away a, a big math problem, uh, and that, I'm going to play that clip, but that may speak to some of the issues around the NDP's credibility. So here's Andrea Horvath answering that question. Uh, when the mistake was um, identified, uh, we fixed it right away. Uh, we acknowledge that uh, that it has occurred, and I think that's what people expect. People want to have uh, the kind of leadership uh, that isn't afraid to be honest uh, about about making a, a mistake like this. Chantal, what, what did you make of that, the admission of the mistake, and then whether that's enough for people to overcome their uncertainty around a party that, that hasn't governed under her and hasn't governed in quite some time? Well, for one, uh, if you're going to have to admit to something like that, you should do so and try to get rid of it in as few news cycles as possible yeah. so you don't lose too many campaign days. And second, I'm guessing the NDP would be more hurt by this if they were running against a, a conservative party that had gone out of its way to uh, feature competence. Hmm. That hasn't happened. And I'll bring you back to, you know, uh, Brian Mulroney saying during the Charlottetown referendum when we asked him, wasn't he sinking the, the accord because he was the champion of it? And his answer was, Mother Teresa, sadly, was not available. 
Well, <laughs> Mother Teresa is not going to be on the Ontario ballot in two weeks either. <laughs> Andrew. <laughs> well, she's the lesser of three evils. I mean, if people dislike Kathleen Wynne and they fear Doug, Tory, Doug Ford, perhaps, then they, you know, Kath, uh, Andrea Horvath looks quite likable and quite competent yeah. compared yeah. to the two. I think there's been sort of two stages of this campaign. Chantel alluded to, you know, at first people just wanted to register, they wanted to get rid of the Liberals. As time has gone on, as it was clear the Tories were way out in front, as it was clear that the Liberals were falling behind the NDP, then it become who's, who can stop the Tories, yeah. and the NDP has emerged as that party. To come back to something Chantel alluded to again, if the Tories had chosen Christine Elliott as their leader, this election would, be, would have been over already. But huh. Ford has given them their opening, and that has created the opportunity for Andre Horvath and the NDP. And this is, as Eric and I were talking about when we got coffee earlier uh, today or yesterday, this is all about the big mo, the, the momentum and who's exactly. got it at this stage. Yeah, and the NDP certainly has it. Every single poll that we've seen in this campaign has shown the NDP better than they were in the previous poll. Uh, the question is whether the New Democrats are going to eventually run up against the ceiling. Uh, the problem is we don't really know what that ceiling is, because in the past we might have been able to estimate uh, what the Liberal or the PC ceiling would have been just by looking mm -hmm. at the history. But for the New Democrats, a lot of people might end up voting for this party that haven't done it in decades or ever. And we don't really know who these people are, where they will be, and if they'll actually turn out to vote. And that'll be one of the big factors in this campaign because the New Democrats are doing well among younger voters yeah. and uh, the PC is doing well among older voters. Older voters tend to vote more than younger voters. How many days left, Eric? Uh, it's June 7th, so we're still talking about <laughs> a little bit less than two weeks. Okay, and we've got a debate on Sunday and Eric and I will, uh, will be hosting that as well so you can watch us there. Thank you, everybody. Good to see you. Thanks for joining us, Eric. Good news if you ever want more of us talking politics, who wouldn't? At Issue is also a podcast. You get extra content and, of course, what we talked about here in podcast form every week. This week, we are going to talk Akon on the podcast, the Canadian construction giant supposed to be taken over by a Chinese company. Not happen happening, says the federal government. Look for the podcast on iTunes any podcast app on our website, cbcnews.ca slash The National. And up next on the program, rental electric scooters popping up in cities across the U.S., the latest solution to help people get from A to B, but there's just one problem. You can see here, while this bike-sharing company has worked out a parking arrangement with the city, while the scooter's been left here partially blocking the sidewalk. So we'll explain what's going on there. But first, the U.S. president showed that he had more than just North Korea on his mind this morning. With an Oval Office flourish, Donald Trump granted a rare posthumous pardon to one of the greatest boxers of all time, Jack Johnson. To correct a wrong that occurred in our history and to honor a truly legendary boxing champion. The president erased what he called a racially motivated injustice connected to Johnson's relationship with a white woman who became his wife more than a century ago. Round one. Johnson broke boxing's color barrier in 1908, the first African-American heavyweight champ. But in 1913, he was convicted by an all-white jury after taking his then-girlfriend across state lines for so-called immoral purposes. That conviction destroyed his boxing career. The case has long been criticized as a miscarriage of justice. For so long, my family was deeply ashamed that my uncle went to prison because of how he was treated. His great-great-niece had pressed Trump for this pardon. That would help to rewrite history and erase the shame and the humiliation that my family felt. Oh, Balboa is taking a tremendous meeting here. And also on hand today, Sylvester Stallone, who called Johnson the inspiration behind the character of Apollo Creed in his Rocky films. His prime was taken away, but somehow... He still managed to persevere and kept a smile on his face, and he's truly an inspirational character. So this has been a long time coming. Well, the sharing economy has a new player, the electric scooter. Companies have started offering them up in cities like Austin and San Francisco. And on the face of it, it seems like something that could work. They're small, green, they zip along, but not everyone is thrilled with them. Kim Brunhuber checked out the scooter craze in Santa Monica, California, to show us why. The first one started showing up a couple of months ago here in Santa Monica. Along the beach, on the streets, even on the sidewalks. 
But what makes these electric scooters unusual is this. Riders are getting off and just leaving them there, anywhere. The concept is simple. You fire up the app to unlock the scooter, you pay for your time and distance travel, then when you're done, you just park it and walk away. Recently, several California companies like Bird and Lime launched versions of this take it and leave it scooter. So in the United States, 40% of all car rides are less than two miles in length. And so that means that there's this real need in cities. Tara Wood Taylor may live in Silicon Valley, but she doesn't have a fancy tech job. She can't afford a car, so she often uses a scooter to get to her three jobs and back safely. And instead of walking home and having to be completely paranoid that somebody's following me, I can hop on a scooter and feel safe. Here in Santa Monica, where Bird is based, the scooters are hit with tourists, like this couple from Picton, Ontario. What do you think of this idea? I think it would go big in Toronto, especially down on the boardwalk. And in town, it, it's, a, it's a big deal. But it's also causing a big problem. So you can see here, while this bike sharing company has worked out a parking arrangement with the city, while the scooter has been left here, partially blocking the sidewalk. Several cities have issued cease and desist orders to keep customers from riding and parking on sidewalks. It caused so many accidents, the city of Santa Monica filed a criminal complaint against Bird, which officials say dumped hundreds of scooters on the city with almost no warning. There was minimal, but from our point of view, um, insufficient outreach or uh, no real plan. The scooter companies are now working to repair the bridges they've burned, but... I don't think that we be appropriate or needed necessary to tell every city, we're going to be coming in and, and, and wait to see what they want to do. This marketing professor says it's just the latest version of the model Uber pioneered. Disrupt first, apologize later. Uh, if they wait around for regulation and the public doesn't see the benefits, it's going to be a harder sell to regulators on allowing them to introduce this. So the race is on to convince customers this convenience is a necessity before the government can get in their way. I got to go eat. Kim Brunhuber, CBC News, Los Angeles. So buying one. There's more ahead on the national. Irish expats are packing up and heading home tonight ahead of a big vote. They are our moment of the day. First, though, while many Canadians, uh, well, Canadians in much of the country, rather, enjoy some early summer heat, the good people of Gander, Newfoundland, woke up to a blizzard this morning. It dumped 30 centimeters of snow on them. And Gander, heck, we just want you to know that Canada is thinking about you. Yes, Gander gets some unpredictable weather this time of year. True, spring snowstorms are not unheard of, but try to convince me that anybody anywhere would choose to wake up to this in late May. Well, okay, maybe this weirdly enthusiastic dog, but he's probably the only one. And sure, some people put on a brave face and took it all in stride. Yeah, I've lived in Newfoundland my whole life, so moving to Gander, I kind of expected the snow. Uh, but, you know, it is springtime, it is snow, you better exercise, but other than that, it's all good. After all, what's 30 centimeters of snow to a bunch of those hardy Newfoundlanders? Their sense of humor can just carry them pretty much through anything. <laughs> and yet, this. It's not the first time this has happened either. Five years ago in late May, Gander got pounded with twice as much snow, about 60 centimeters. They took that in stride too. But we had a good weekend, we stayed home, we didn't go camping. Good on ya, buddy. But as we look at these grim images from today, a week before the start of June, by the way, one feels starved to hear someone drop the pretense of positivity and just say what everyone's really thinking. Enter Gordon Hogan. I don't want it. <laughs> I don't want to see it. That's it. Get some of the nerves. Snow with snow, I'm sick of it. boy, Gord. That's all I got to say, boy. That's all I got to say. Yeah. So now, when this finally melts, we're hoping the mic melts. The stories behind the story. The Weekly with Wendy Mesley, Sunday morning at 11 on CBC.
Tonight on The National, a legal win for Kinder Morgan after B.C. Supreme Court tossed out two legal challenges over the Trans Mountain Pipeline project. The city of Vancouver and the Squamish Nation were challenging the B.C. government's environmental approval of the project, but the court dismissed their petitions today, saying the government acted reasonably. There's a new development tonight in the investigation into last week's deadly plane crash in Havana. Cuban State TV is reporting that search crews have found the plane's flight data recorder. No word on its condition, but it's considered key to figuring out what went wrong. All but two of the 113 people on board the plane were killed when it went down shortly after takeoff last Friday. And just over a week away from the official start of the 2018 hurricane season, and the forecast is out. The Canadian Hurricane Center says it will likely be an active season in the Atlantic, but not as busy as last year. Between five and nine hurricanes are expected. Compare that to last year when officials forecasted an above average season, and they were right. There were 10 hurricanes, and you might remember three in particular, Harvey, Irma, and Maria, all with devastating impacts. Ireland heads to the polls tomorrow, this time to vote in a referendum on the country's abortion law. The Eighth Amendment currently outlaws nearly all abortions, and it has prompted many expats to fly home to vote. We asked two of them why it was important for them to make the trip from Canada to Ireland, and that is our moment of the day. It was important to me to fly home to vote as I am a student of politics, and not only that, but I am a woman of Ireland. At least nine women a day will travel to England and the UK to seek an abortion there. Uh, at least another two will order pills online. I wanted to make sure that the women of Ireland were able to make their own decisions and their own choices based on their own bodies. It's one flight I can take. That means that never again does an Irish woman have to get on a boat or a plane to seek the medical support and attention that this country should be providing for her. No two experiences are the same, no two women are the same. So I believe that we should have a healthcare system that supports us. I am voting to repeal the Eighth Amendment. While this may never affect me in my life, it will affect my children and the future generations to come. So the last time something like this happened in Ireland was with the same-sex uh, referendum. It was back in 2015. Same kind of phenomenon. People flocked back to the country to vote. That that passed, of course. Uh, this time, everyone agrees it's it's different. Uh, obviously, the issue is different. Uh, but there's, as you see, lots of people going back. And they expect that the results of the vote will actually be very close. Yeah, that doesn't surprise me at all. And to further give people a sense of just how seriously people are taking this, there are even Irish citizens who, who've been living abroad for, for too long to retain their right to vote, but yeah. who are instead paying for others to, to fly yeah. back and to vote in this thing. So it just gives people a sense of uh, what's at stake here. That's The National for this May 24th. Thanks for joining us. Good night.